Hello, and welcome to the Computing Conversations column. This column is from the April 2013 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled, Larry Smar, Building Mosaic. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I'm the editor of the column, and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan. Over the next two years, we'll celebrate 20-year anniversaries marking the release of the various versions of NCSA Mosaic, or as it has become more simply known, Mosaic, the first web browser that worked across Unix, Macintosh, and Windows environments, and led to the Internet's rapid expansion beyond the academic world. Mosaic's roots are in the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, NCSA, at the University of Illinois. In an interview taped back in 1997, three years after the first Mosaic release, I talked with Larry Smarr, who was then the NCSA director, and asked him why Mosaic happened at NCSA and not somewhere else. The first supercomputer centers essentially focused on installing and maintaining supercomputer equipment and making it available to customers. NCSA went a step further and built a client-server model using personal computers as the clients and supercomputers as the servers. Long before NCSA Mosaic was imagined, NCSA worked on software that could make a Macintosh and Microsoft DOS computers capable of connecting to and working with supercomputers. We knew from the beginning that the personal computer was the real computer. That was the computer that was going to change the world. But, you know, we're starting the Sinners program two years after the IBM PC came out. Remember, we're, we're, maybe the XT <laughs> was available at that time. The Mac was light years ahead of, of DOS on, you know, four color, black, white, magenta, and cyan. Um, and, and so we did a lot of work with the Mac, but also uh, even DOS. So the first thing was clear is um, Unix wizards knew how to do telnet and remote login to bring remote computers up on your screen. But ordinary folks with Macs and DOS didn't have a clue, so that's why we developed NCSA Telnet, which was software that allowed you to have multiple computer, remote computers open on your screen and doing remote sessions in them, uh, which is how you had to behave if you were going to be in a networked world. Well, of course, that was client-server. And now, of course, that is the basis of the whole corporate uh, IT industry. But back then, it just seemed like the logical next step to us as we moved to a network world. Um, we had this, we'd make these pictures of the Macintosh screen with a little cray icon on the Mac, and then the title would be Hide the Cray. Now, this was totally radical. Why? Because we were taking the supercomputer and the mass storage systems out of Livermore and Los Alamos and essentially just literally cloning them. I mean, we were using the Cray time sharing system, we were using the mass store software they used, it was literally just cloned it. But at Livermore and Los Alamos at that time, you did the word processing and your editing on the Cray from a dumb terminal. There was no notion that you use the personal computer. There was no client server. There was just time sharing. Because NCSA wanted to allow anyone to access its supercomputers, it decided to give the software away at no charge and make the releases available using anonymous FTP servers. We could have taken Telnet and tried to keep the intellectual property or do whatever, you know, tie it up. But instead we said, if we're going to get anywhere, let's just give it to everybody. Now this was considered, again, kind of radical. Um, turned out that, that later on the authors of, one of the authors, Gage Paulson, uh, went out and started up a company, Intercon, which was later bought, and it was a successful private sector company. But we didn't let that interfere with our primary mission, which was to get out software to enable people to be better able to use high-performance computing than they would have otherwise. We invented the notion of, well, I don't know if we invented it, but we adopted the notion of putting up the... Um, software on anonymous FTP servers and letting people download it and the rapid prototyping that the world now thinks um, is the way to go. I mean, that was being done 12 years ago with Telnet. Uh, every time we'd come up with a new rev, we'd just put it up on the anonymous server. You want it, you'd take it down. If NCSA had decided, let's 
make a distribution unit and a warehouse and let's hire lots of secretaries to take people's names and numbers and let's charge for it. Um, the internet would have been much more slow in coming because you know, many people, large fraction, probably people that first got on the internet did so using NCSA Telnet. Having NCSA Telnet available throughout the late 1980s meant that as NSFNet was gaining popularity, users of both Microsoft DOS and Macintosh computers could participate in this new and increasingly networked world. Another trend throughout the 90s was a move away from purely text-based interaction with computers to the increasing use of images to visualize and communicate data. But managing large image files was challenging in a world of 720 kilobyte floppy disks, 5 megabyte hard drives, 640 by 480 pixels, and 2400 baud modems. Initially, managing images required costly and specialized hardware and software. NCSA tackled this by building software to improve PCs' image handling capabilities. What NCSA Image did was basically we said we want to build a world of infrastructure in which it's as easy to move an image around as it is to move a word. That was our design parameters, back, and, and that's the way we talked about it back then. So that meant we had to scale the network, scale the disk drives, scale the compute power. We had to go to full color. When the Mac II first came out, 256 color levels, uh, we got 50 of them. Apple gave us 50 Mac IIs, which was like stunning uh, in those days. We were, in fact, were the largest funded um, group in the academic group in the country for the Apple Advanced Technology Group. IBM at that time was telling their customers, you don't need color. We've already provided it, as I said. You have four of them, black, white, cyan, and magenta. Why would you need more? So what we did was we took things that were on $100,000 computer graphics workstations of image processing that medical imaging people used, satellite reconnaissance people used, and we took all that, put it into software and NCSA image on the Mac. And so you could just move the mouse and do what it would take you, what would have otherwise cost you $100,000 to do, and you'd have to be an elite specialist. But again, taking things that elite people knew how to do, could afford to do, and making it available to the masses. Just as before, NCSA Image was also available for download at no charge through anonymous FTP servers. The next logical step was to build NCSA Collage, a synchronous collaboration environment. Developed in 1990 and 1991, Collage allowed multiple users at different locations to interact working on data using a shared whiteboard and shared applications. NCSA Collage was one of the world's earliest network-based virtual meeting rooms. We uh, did a live demo that most people that were in the room will never forget. We had people at Cornell, at Pittsburgh, at NCSA, and at San Diego, all on a collage synchronous uh, link up from their workstations. And then we had a telephone conference call so that they were all uh, simultaneously talking. And then we had this projected, um, I don't know, probably a Mac, uh, onto the wall with the speakerphone. And what what happened is one person would bring up a whiteboard or they'd open up a color image and then someone else would draw a line across it and then up would come a sort of a contour map across that line of the image and and they were all in this conversation and from where you were sitting in the room it was all coming from this one speaker and one screen because everything was melded together and all of a sudden everybody got it in cyberspace distance doesn't exist Everybody is in one point. Because NCSA wanted to add shared document viewing to Collage, it set out to build a way for people to simultaneously view and annotate documents. We set up a team to go after what would be the right um, document retrieval uh, mechanism. And Dave Thompson, who was another one of our uh, undergraduate, um, computer science undergraduate guys, he um, found this thing called the World Wide Web. And that seemed pretty cool because it was not just documents, but it was hyper documents. Um, and so we put a team developing um, a module to go into Collage, which became the Unix version of Mosaic. Uh, Mark Andreessen, Eric Bina 
were the two Unix developers, and then we gradually developed Mac and, and um, uh, Windows versions. By then, DOS had gone to Windows. Uh, but again, what this was is client multi-server, and it got to pick up so much momentum of its own that it, it sort of got dislodged from collage and just became its own thing. In a sense, collage was too far ahead of its time for broad adoption. While users at supercomputing centers, research labs, and leading universities had enough bandwidth and desktop computing power to handle multi-user screen sharing sessions, the average person was lucky to have the latest high-speed 14.4 kilobit modem. The average user didn't have enough power or bandwidth to do real-time two-way synchronous collaboration, but it was possible to download and view simple web pages with a few embedded images and hyperlinks to other interesting pages. NCSA Mosaic quickly became a popular standalone product and was ported to the Macintosh and Windows systems, again released as freely downloadable software for non-commercial use. NCSA also developed the NCSA web server, known as HTTPD, and released it as freely downloadable public domain software. The NCSA HTTPD software would later become the basis of Apache 1.x web server. The combination of an easy to install and use browser and web server, as well as the increasing speed of the NSFNet backbone and home internet connections set off a viral storm of people finding Mosaic and using the web. And what it did is it set off a nonlinear growth curve that's continued to this day. Once you had an easy to use point and click interface to the World Wide Web, then people started looking at the servers. Until then, it had been mainly geeks looking at geeks. Um, and when they saw how cool stuff looked when it was put on the web, people said, well, I have cooler stuff than that. I want people to see me. And so they got their copy of NCSA uh, web server, HTTPD, and put it up their own web server and, and started putting their own stuff up. But then there was more stuff to look at. And therefore, there was more reason to download the viewer. <laughs> and, and so it just got into this bootstrap. It was, in the end, all driven by nar narcissism. I mean, it's basically people wanted to put their own stuff out that people could see who they were. It was a very strange effect. Almost as quickly as Mosaic created a viral storm of web adoption, the attention quickly shifted from software produced by academics to commercial web browsers. The University of Illinois licensed various aspects of Mosaic in early 1994, and in August, the earlier NCSA spin-out Spyglass negotiated the exclusive right to relicense Mosaic for commercial use. And then gradually, um, without going into the details, roughly speaking, a lot of the Mosaic programmers went off and joined Mark Andreessen and Jim Clark and formed Netscape. Microsoft licensed, as did a hundred other companies, uh, the rights to use various things about Mosaic, and that led to the Internet Explorer and the two dominant uh, browsers uh, in the business. The University of Illinois has a long tradition of developing software within the university and allowing it to move outside the university as it becomes a commercial product. From the outset, NCSA and the University of Illinois were very clear that their mission was to innovate and advance the state of the art of computing and network technology. They fully understood that building a commercial product adds many layers of complexity. If they got bogged down commercializing any one product, it would consume valuable resources and shift focus away from the efforts to develop the next innovation. The introduction of NCSA Mosaic on Unix, Macintosh, and Microsoft in 1993 and 1994 seemed like an overnight success. However, in reality, Mosaic was the result of nearly a decade of continuous investment to build software that ran across three platforms with a goal of involving as many end users in the network as possible without requiring the purchase of special high-end equipment. In a sense, once NCSA developed Telnet, Image, and Collage, Building Mosaic was the next logical step for MCSA, but the overall effort was a great leap for mankind that has forever changed our world. This column is from the April 2013 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled, Larry Smarr, Building Mosaic. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I'm the editor of the column, and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan.